Well, we're going to continue on stories today, and this is a story that we are going to draw some real tasty flavor from today, the story of Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius is not a prominent individual in the scripture, uh, but it's, he's a pretty interesting one in that he's just a very unconven- unconventional story of, of conversion. Uh, what we know about Cornelius is that he's Greek in a Greek world, uh, so he, it would have been appropriate for him to follow Greek and traditional uh, Greco-Roman values and belief systems. But he doesn't. Instead, he's Jewish, which is so absurd. He's, he's a Jewish Greek, and his whole household follows likewise. Uh, and so we're going to get into some things about this story that I really like. Uh, but as I was thinking about this story this week, um, I was reminded of a hymn. And in this hymn, I'll give you a little bit of the backstory. In this hymn, uh, it's a very simple one. It's an older one. But it actually, the, the story goes that it originates back in the 1800s in North India when a man and his household converted to Christianity. And they were devout and they were fully committed to their faith and to Jesus. But in northern India, even today, it's hostile to, towards Christianity. So, in the 1800s, this man and his family were found out that they were Christians, and they were being persecuted for it. In fact, they were being presented uh, to the, the town chief, or the village chief, and they were in the process of being executed. And so, as this process was going on, the man was beginning to proclaim out in response to their demand for him to renounce his devotion to Jesus, he instead pronounced out his unwavering commitment to Jesus instead. And from that, we get the kind of the genesis, the origin of this song. And in this song, it was, it was turned into, it was a, th- those words that he was speaking were turned into a hymn in India. And then in the 1940s, an American hymnist repackaged it. So I want to do this song today. And I want you just to listen to the words. I'm going to talk through it. Okay, we on here? Yeah, good. Okay, so it's, it's a super simple song. And if you've heard it, you can, you can probably pick it up pretty quick. If you haven't, it's okay. There's probably a kid's version that's more popular, so I'm going to try not to sing the kid's version. Does that sound good? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. you know this song, okay? So this next verse re-emphasizes this. So it's, it's saying that this is real. It's not just in word. It's not just in, in theory, but this is how my life looks. And so this next one goes like this. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before So what gets real, this next part, like if you imagine you're in North India and everybody else believes the opposite of you and is persecuting you, and you have to make the decision, am I going to follow or am I going to do my own thing? So this is how the next verse goes. He says, Though none go with me, still I will follow. No, none go with me, still I will follow. appeal to everyone else and ask us how we will respond. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you decided to follow Jesus? Okay? 
So this is the story of this, this Indian man, but it's also the story of Cornelius. This is, this is the life that he lived. He lives in a Greek world among Greek people with Greek religions and Greek gods, and yet he says, that's not who I'm going to follow. I'm going to devote myself to the Lord. And it's uncommon, and it's really inappropriate because even in Acts chapter 10, what we're going to be reading today is that Greeks don't become Jewish. We don't even know if they're allowed to become Jewish yet. We haven't even set that precedent with the council yet, and so that's why the Lord has to intervene. Uh, if you can continue reading in Acts chapter 10, which we're not going to do today, but you have access to a Bible on your phone. You can do this. If you don't even have a paper Bible, you can go read Acts chapter 10 on your own, and you can read what happens. Pretty remarkable. In summary, what happens is that Peter has this dream, and the Lord speaks to him, this, him in this dream and says, hey, it's not up to you to decide what's unclean. I've made this clean. And so he's saying, you can go and you can talk to this, this Roman soldier, and though he, he's not born Jewish, and he does not look Jewish, and he's not talk Jewish, you can treat him in the way that I have treated you, with that grace and mercy, and, I'm, and extend that invitation into the kingdom with him. Okay, so we're getting the idea of who Cornelius is. Everybody's really Cornelius professionals now, right? Right? So uh, if you were to, to be able to ask, hey, you know that guy Cornelius in the Bible, you could tell just a brief synopsis. You, you're good. You're caught up now. You're in good shape. All right. So uh, what, I, what we have here is um, this truth, and that is this, that behaviors aren't the cause of devotion. They are the effect. Behaviors aren't the cause of devotion. They are the effect. And this is when you read it up there, and I look at this, and I'm like, well, of course that's the case. But we don't often live this way. Often we try to ch change our behavior first and then be devoted. I, you can argue with me, but just wait till January. When everybody's behaviors change, when their, their devotion isn't changed. When they say things like, I'm going to get healthy this year. And I'm going to do things that are going to make me be healthy. And we try to change behaviors and hope that they're going to affect our devotion. And then by February 1st, we just pretend like we didn't even make the promise in the first place. So behaviors aren't the cause of devotion, they're the effect of devotion. We see that in our scripture today, and, our, and really we see it as a truth throughout scripture. So let's look at Acts chapter 10 again, and I want us to walk through a little bit, and we're going to read this passage together, and we're going to try to draw our attention to the different aspects of Cornelius' life, really his character, to help us understand what his devotion was based out of. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. We'll have it up here if you want to read along. In, C in Caesarea, Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer, or a centurion, in your translation might say, named Cornelius, who was the captain of the Italian regiment. This is what it says. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Okay, so real quick. So we see that he's a captain of the Italian regiment, or, or a uh, centurion. So think about like, um, do we have military people? Any military people in the room? Where's Rob? Rob's here. So, so um, I, I researched this, Rob, and tried to figure out what the modern American equivalent of a centurion would be, and it's debatable. But if we just, for all simplicity's sake, an army captain, or maybe a sergeant, but probably like an army captain, or, so a high-ranking individual where people actually report to this person. So we're not talking about like a, a, a general infantry enlistee. Like it's not somebody who's just off the street and has no authority or no influence. This is somebody who, of prominence. And we even see here in two, it says that uh, he was a devout god free man, as was everyone in his household. So the meaning that he is the head of household, he's an influencer, he's got authority and power, and that everyone around him who follows him follows in his likeness. Okay, so he's a God-fearing man, and everyone is in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. So we notice here that he's devout, and then the actions, the behaviors follow after. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of, the, of God coming towards him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror because if you were to see an angel, you probably would be terrified as well. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, replied your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. 
He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel of the Lord was gone, Cornelius called to his whole household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants, and he told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. So not only do we see that this man, Cornelius, is devout, but that even the people who follow him are devout to him and to the Lord because they're so willing to respond to his instruction. All right, so we're getting this picture. We're painting this picture now of this man, Cornelius, who doesn't know any prominent Christian individuals. He really doesn't know anything about Jesus at this point. He only knows about who the Lord is, and he has devoted himself to the God of Israel, but he hasn't had the full picture painted yet. He hasn't gotten the whole description. He hasn't got the whole gospel story yet. He just prays earnestly, and the Lord reveals who he is. Now, this is pretty cool because— there is a question that we're not going to get into today, and it's probably like we can workshop it some other time. But what happens to people who never hear the gospel? Well, this is a pretty cool story, and it's somebody who had never heard the gospel, yet his heart was positioned to be receptive of God, and the Lord gave him a vision and made a way for somebody to come and reveal it. How, how hopeful is that, that even in the darkest places of the world, people who, who don't have readily, readily, ready access to— who Jesus is, if they pray in earnest that the Lord will provide and reveal what it is that they need in order to receive the gospel. And so, we're not going to workshop that today, but it just kind of does give us a little bit of hope and an example in scripture of an individual who can have access to the gospel without having that kind of access to the gospel that we have. All right, so we see some, we've got some, some descriptions about who he is. Last week we talked about Ruth, and we talked about her devotion and how her devotion became the glue for a household to be built in which the king of Israel came out of, and she wasn't even a Jew. She was a Moabite. And here, likewise, we have another story of a man of devotion who shouldn't have devotion like he does. He is a devout, God-fearing man. Um, Cornelius, we look at Cornelius' story, and we see that his story— Cornelius' behavior of devotion followed his decision of devo- devotion. That a decision is what preceded his behaviors. A choice. A choice that had to be made. He, he, he was devout. He was committed. And because he was devout and committed, he gave to the poor. He prayed earnestly. He was faithful. He led his family in a way that led them to the Lord. His behaviors became a reflection of his devo- devotion rather than the other way around. And so we lay the foundation saying that devotion is the foundation and then behavior comes after. Now, I say all that because there's a common problem that we face is that we often get these inverted and we try to change behavior while remaining the same person. We try not to change who we are. We try not to change our character, but we just want our behaviors to change. We want our attitude to change. We want our habits to change. But instead of allowing our our character and our person to be transformed, we just want the outward expression to be transformed. But that's not how it works. In church, we're often told to pray, to give, to study, to attend. Like, if we do these things, if we go through the motions of the behaviors of Christian life, then God's going to like us more. If we pray, then God likes it when I pray. If I give, then God likes it more when I give. When, when I attend regularly, or when I study the Bible, when I do the things that Christians model for me to do, then God's going to like me more than he does now. But rather, I, I believe it actually is more disappointing to the Lord because rather he wants us to love him first and let that love, out of that love, the devotion begin to drive our behaviors. That we pray more because of our devotion to the Lord, that we give more, that we attend more, that we serve more, that we grow more, that we participate more, that we repent, that we forgive more, that we sacrifice more, that we have greater compassion, that all of these things are the outpour of our devotion because we know who the Father is. And we are changed, and therefore our behaviors change. Devotion commands behavior because being comes before doing. Being comes before doing. What I do naturally comes out of who I am or who I believe myself to be. So here's an example that I'm thinking of, okay? Suppose, so what's the expression? I I wasn't born in Texas, but gosh, you guys, give me some life here, all right? I'm not born in Texas, but 
I got here as soon as I could. Okay, so some people in this room, whether you're from Illinois or you're from, uh, where are some people from in this? Massachusetts, California. Okay, where else are we from? Michigan, Minnesota. We're from all over the place. But you got here as quick as you could, right? So when you came to Texas, you did not move to Texas and think, all right, in order to be Texan, there's some things I have to do. I have to get a pickup truck. I have to eat tacos twice a week. And I have to become a high school football fan. If I do these things, then I will therefore become a true Texan. No one thinks this way. It's just something that happens if you live here long enough. You somehow end up with these things. You end up with the Texas attributes, not because you have a list. You know, there's no like you drive in through uh, Gainesville and you stop at the Welcome Center and you say, okay, what do I need to do to actually live here? And they give you a list or a little pamphlet or a booklet saying, these are the things that will qualify you and then people will treat you like a Texan. No, that doesn't work that way. You just kind of get immersed into it and you learn because you, be, you, you change who you are. And so suddenly you start saying the word y'all and you're like, oh, that's, that's, what am I talking about? I don't talk like that. I don't, I don't need to speak like fixing to you. What, is that, what are we talking about here? That's not how we talk. And what do you, why do you always criticize me when I say pop? Some, some, does anybody say pop in here? Anybody try really hard to not say pop? Why? You know why? Because you're Texan. That's right. You don't say pop. We're not from Michigan, Rob. Everything's a pop. So, okay, so you're getting what I'm saying here. Think about marriage, for example. This is, this is really common. Um, I think maybe if we just live, to, live together for a while, then we'll be able to test out if we want to get married. That's a horrible idea. That's a horrible idea. Do you know why? Because what you're really saying is, let's enter into a contractual, legally binding agreement so that we can only break up 12 months from now. Does that make any logical sense? But what we're doing is that we're saying, um, what we're saying is, I am going to behave as though I am devoted to you without actually being devoted to you. Let's share our grocery budget. Let's share our personal space. Let's share a legal contract together and see if that leads to a place where we are going to want to be devoted to each other. But really what that ends up doing is it puts a burden on the relationship and creates hostility and friction and discouragement and then eventual separation. And how often do we run into that in other areas of our life? How easy is it for us to run into that in our in regard to our faith and devotion. If I just do the things because that's what people expect of me, where I think God expects of me, and that, then it'll turn into something I really love and am devoted to. But really, it turns into resentment and bitterness and hostility and abandonment. I'm out. I don't want to do this anymore. It's just a bunch of work, and I don't know that it's worth it. It's not real. And then separation incurs. Okay, so you're getting this. Okay, so you're getting the idea. I can see it in your eyes. There's nods. Subtle head nods tell me a lot. Yeah, I get it. Okay, so what I mean when I say devotion, and what I think the Bible means when it says devotion. Devotion is just sim simply defined as a decision to be. It's a decision to be. It's not something we do. It's something we are. We are devoted. It's not something we—we we don't do devotion. We don't participate in activities of devotion. We are devoted, and the activities are reflections of that devotion. Our commitment dictates the things that we do. So we don't—it's sometimes we think in, like, I have to have my devotion lined out. I've got to—I've got to behave a certain way because otherwise I'm not devoted. Well, if you're behaving a certain way, it's probably because you're already not devoted. You're already not living a certain way, and the, uh, changing the behavior isn't going to reshape it. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story from my life, since we're all telling stories this week, this month. Um, a story of my life, when I was probably uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, something, probably that window of life, somewhere in there, uh, I wrestled pretty heavily with anxiety. Uh, I grew up in a household where anxiety was uh, a normal activity, a normal 
attitude in my household. Uh, if I didn't worry, then I was told that I need to be more concerned about things. And so it was kind of imposed upon me to overthink, to dramatize, to panic, to be stressed out. And um, I didn't know any different because that's all I had ever seen. That's all I'd ever known. And, and so I just kind of grew up in this, this attitude of this was normal. And then I went to college and moved out of my parents' house and interacted with other humans who were like, like in my season of life, and they didn't think this way. And I thought it was puzzling that other people didn't have the life that I did. And when I tried to project, like, you should be more stressed about that, or you should overthink that. You know, I didn't say those words, but, you know, you've never been in that situation where somebody, like, panics on your behalf. You know, like that's kind of how I was to other people. And then they didn't receive it. And they just said, you know, you know, we're okay. God's good, you know. I'm like, what do you mean God's good? You should be, you know, we, I, I try to get, I get all riled up. But then it just it was revealed to me that maybe it wasn't, my, my normal wasn't the, the normal that God wanted for me. And so I began to walk with the Lord and begin to understand that he has a purpose and a promise for me. And that that wasn't part of it that living in a stressed out normal was not what he wanted for me. And anxiety wasn't a promise of God. It wasn't something I had to cope with. It wasn't something I had to own. Instead, it was something that could be redeemed. It could be something that could be healed in my life. And this realization, this really the, the transformation took place when I began to realize the kind of person I wanted to be, not the activities I wanted to do. And when I saw in Jesus the kind of person that he was, then I began to pray, God, would you help me be a man of peace, a man of patience, a man of endurance, a man of courage. And so in these things, I began to speak these things over my own life and invite Jesus to change who I was, not just the way that I thought and did, but the person I was, because it's different to have peace than to be a person of peace. Like it's one, like one can be fleeting, one can be circumstantial. I have peace in the moment. Well, what happens in 20 minutes when somebody sends you a text message that riles you all up again? Is the peace constant? You can be a person of peace regardless of your circumstances, regardless of the environment. We can possess it no matter what we're going through. And this is what, this is what I believe Cornelius had embraced, that he was a person of devotion. It was who he was, and as a result, his actions followed. That's why he prayed in earnest. That's why he gave generously to the poor. That's why his family was devout as he was, because of the person that he was, because of his character was true and faithful. Not because he modeled things well or he's so excellent, because he could sing a worship song as well as I can. But because of his level of devotion, it was an outpouring of things that God had done in his life. And he wanted more, and the Lord rewarded him for that. So when Jesus seeks our devotion, because he does seek your devotion, he does seek your devotion, he's not asking for us to do better. Yet we often ask ourselves to do better, don't we? He's not asking us to do better. He's not asking us to do more. He's not asking us to do anything. He's asking us to be his followers. And as we become his followers, then we will naturally do these other things. We'll, our devotion will, our expressions of devotion will increase. By being a follower, our behavior will change. And we can try really hard to be our very best person. And I'm going to try really hard to not get angry today. I'm going to try really hard to not get fearful today. I'm going to try really hard to not get selfish again. Because that's what I know what happens when I get selfish. I'm going to try really hard to pray more this week. I'm going to try really hard to serve more this spring. I'm going to try really hard to study more this year. We can try that, but it isn't, they're not becoming statements. They're doing statements. And if we can try to just keep doing, it's going to end in frustration and discouragement. But if we instead allow Jesus to form who we become, then our approach gets inverted. It sounds backwards. Our response to this sounds backwards, but we actually start by being, 
not by taking action, by changing our p- posture, changing our position. And this is how it works, because it's not really not us. It's not like we can control who we are. I, Trey can't just say, well, I'm going to be different, right? Because that's, that's willpower, and that's not really how the Holy Spirit works. But rather, Jesus is the one that enables us to do it. He's the one, because that's what grace is. Grace is undeserved favor. It's something that you didn't deserve, you didn't earn, you're not capable of deserving or earning, but it's just something that he gives to you out of affection and appreciation and belonging, and he gives this to you, and what it does is it does two things. Jesus, not only does he implore us to be people of devotion, at all costs to him, it empowers us to be people of devotion. He implores us and he empowers us. So not only does the grace of God enable us to walk out of all of our past sins and failures and struggles and defeats. It also empowers us to be people of devotion. His grace is what gives us the strength, the courage, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the fruit of the Spirit. All of these things come out of our position of devotion and is the result of it. And so we don't have to try to manufacture, mechanically organize how we're going to live and how we're going to think and what we're going to do and what we're not going to stop doing and what we don't want to do anymore and what we're, how we're going to respond to that person when they say this thing that they're probably not going to say, but in our head they've already said it, so we need to respond. So all of these things, these are, these are do statements, but if we can reposition ourselves to be people who are devoted, who are devoted, not do devoted, but are devoted, then we can re- receive this imploring on Jesus to be devoted, but also his empowerment to be devoted as well. How awesome is that, that the burden isn't on you and I to be devoted? That it doesn't, it's not up to you and me to to be devoted. We just make a decision, but Jesus is the one that empowers us to do it. That we can live fully in his grace and his mercy and receive his peace, and that's what brings transformation in our life. So when we see in ourselves— the behaviors we want to change this week or this month, or hopefully you do. Hopefully, hopefully we're all people, and you know, I'm going to speak this over you. We're all people who see areas of our life at times, not all the time, but at times, where we say, I, I want to grow in that. That's, that's not what I want to see in my life anymore. So when we see these behaviors you want to change, what if we just said in those moments— not, I'm going to do better, I'm going to try harder, but just simply said, Jesus, I need you to help me. I need you to help me. What if we made this statement? I think this is a really hard statement. What if we said, I can't be any different than this without you? That is an uncomfortable statement, that this nasty thing that just came out of me, this problem, this habit, I, this is who I am without you. I can't be any different without you. That can be a really hard statement to speak over our own life. But what it does is it gives access for Jesus to empower us. If we say, I can be different, Jesus, just watch me be different. What we're saying is, I don't need your power. I don't need your authority. I don't need your strength. So this week, when you object to your own behavior, speak your decision to devote. You say, that's not who I want to be. That's not the man I want to be. That's not the woman. I'm better than that because Jesus has done work in my life, and I don't have to live with that issue in my life anymore. When I look at Cornelius, it says Cornelius had a household, which means different. And we've talked about this a little bit over the last couple weeks, but just to kind of a refresher, when it says that Cornelius had a household, it means that he had a wife and probably many children. He had people who he employed that were part of his household. He had people who served in his household. He probably had other people who followed his leadership as well. And so when we look at the life of Cornelius, we see that he was a person of influence. He was a person of of an importance. And as a result, the scripture says that his whole household followed suit. It even says that one of his his servants, when he was instructed, who was also devout, went and found Peter, Simon Peter, and brought him back. And I just think about that in this context, and really apply it to my own context, and think about what does it look like 
for me to be devout in a way that affects my household. I think it probably has more to do than my activities, than my lifestyle, my musical interest, or my sleeping patterns, and all of these other, like, peripheral things. Yes, those things matter, and yes, my children, my family, my community watches those things. But more so, those things are just a byproduct of the person that I want to be, that I want Jesus to make me into. And so the more that I can allow myself to be devoted, then all my habits, all my hang-ups, all my attitudes, all my behaviors, all my goals and dreams, all my visions, uh, sense of humor, personality, all of these things begin to wrap around who I am in Jesus because I've made a decision of who I want to be, not the things I want to do. Y'all, I'm going to tell you, you are going to find yourself exhausted trying to keep a mental list of all the things that Christians are supposed to do and making sure you do them all the time. It's going to wear you out. It's, it's, you're either going to get burnt out or you're just going to fail all the time and be humiliated. But if you instead let the root be changed, then your fruit is going to be the result of it. It's going to naturally grow out of the person that you are becoming. And the good thing is that you don't have to be that today. You just have to make the decision today. And as the decision is shaped, then your devotion will follow. And you look at this song that I sang about the, you know, that's really inspired by this convert in India. How do you get to the place where you're willing to be a martyr? That can be really a, a scary idea. And I, I really hope that none of you get executed. Really, I'll pray that over you. Like, I hope that None of you get executed for your faith. I really hope that you live to be 110 years old, okay? That you live a full life and that it's productive for the kingdom and for your family. I, I really hope that for you. But should something happen, how do you get to the place where you're willing to make those declarative statements over your own life that though none may follow, no, none go with me, I, I will follow, the cross before me, the world is behind me. Like, how do we get to the place where we make those statements over our life, even today? Not just when somebody's pointing a gun to our head, but so that it's just a normal part of our life. This comes with devotion. It doesn't come with a list of behaviors or attitudes or habits or those sorts of things, but instead it comes when we shift our, our mentality to make a decision and let Jesus empower us to be devoted. So this week, when you object to your own behavior, speak your decision. That's not who I want to be. What if your decision was to be devoted affected your entire household? That's what my hope is, is that we can be a church of households devoted to Jesus. Not just a church of individuals, but households. And that our devotion would feed over one to the other, and we would propel one another forward. So let's do another story. Uh, a lifeline story that really highlights the grace and mercy of God and his empowerment and his mercy in our life. And so I'd like to invite my friend Isaac up to share. Uh, he's got a microphone. Good. Okay, so why don't you come up here, folks? This is Isaac, and uh, I'll, t I'll give you a little bit of— I'll give you a little bit of insight into Isaac's life, and you, I don't know all the details, so that's why Isaac's up here to tell. Um, Isaac just graduated and just got married, and, uh, and is, I guess, starting your own household, in, yep. in a sense. Um, but Isaac is, was part of our Chi Alpha ministry and still serves there in a volunteer capacity, and uh, accidentally found us in a oh, class yeah. from a friend. And so I think that's going to come up in your story a little bit, yes, but you're in a different place today than you were when, we, when I first met you, and I'd love for you to share a little bit about that today. So I grew up in a Catholic family, uh, and so God was a large part of my life uh, going into it. But going into college, I had a hard time finding community to at least practice my faith with. And after coming off of a bad relationship and being having a hard time uh, finding, I, I found, was able to find friends, but I was at a hard time finding friends that wanted to go to church that had faith that I shared with. Um, so it was not until uh, my second semester of one of my classes, I met someone uh, who became my friend and who openly talked about God. Um, she always proclaimed God's goodness in her life and everything she's done. Uh, and the good things that have come out of it. And I thought to myself, I go to church by myself. 
I was unable to really connect with the church I went to. Um, but here I have someone who talks about it openly. So I asked them, hey, I won't be going home this weekend for Easter. Uh, yeah, going home for Easter. So is it okay if I come with you to your church? And that was my first trying to like extend myself or um, God to um, basically reach out because I've been asking God, God, I've been, I feel alone in my faith. I've not had anyone with me. It's just been me and you. And I know there's been others around me in the mm -hmm. churches I've gone to, but I don't feel like I'm a part. I don't feel like my faith is growing in where I've been. So I joined them. Uh, I had Easter mass. It was my first time going to uh, Eagle Point Church here in Denton. Um, and it wouldn't be until a year later, I would be get a message from my friend that they said, Hey, I don't know what you're up to, but if you're not busy, I want to invite you to this game called Kingdoms, which she explained very uh, basically as a week-long game of tag. And let me tell you, that was the most complicated week-long game of tag <laughs> I've ever experienced. Um, but going through this week of meeting new faces, meeting new people who uh, also had like minds of being close to God, wanting to be together with God, um, it gave me not just like hope of a, being a part of this community, but just like an understanding of, hey, I can be able to, I can talk to people about my faith. This is not something I can I end up sharing with just me, myself, with my prayers, but I can be able to talk with others about my faith. So slowly I joined this community known as Chi Alpha. Um, and it wasn't easy because I was living a string of my every day of going to my classes, seeing my friends at night and hanging out. And what I was doing was I was breaking a routine in my life that mm. basically I, I was complacent with. Mm. Um, but the only thing that was gnawing at me when I was a part of this life is I had no community for my faith. Mm. I had friends around me who loved me, but I didn't have friends I could talk to about my faith. And that in this process, these friends that I had were pulling me back saying, hey, you're not doing the same things you used to do, you're changing. And at first it kind of daunted on me. It made me like, is this the right thing? Is joining this new community, is just um, finding this community of God what I really want? And I did, I really wanted it. I really wanted to be closer with God. And it, it was a struggle. It wasn't easy just to join a new community and meet new faces because I guess my old life was still pulling me back um, and clawing at me to stick with what I was doing before and not really moving forward in my life. So I kept moving and in this process I met leaders who helped me um, develop and uh, increase my knowledge for the faith. I met friends who I've been close with and developed really strong bonds with. And I found my wife uh, from this community and a partner who I believe I will be together with it forever. Um, it was not an easy journey. It wasn't a straightforward journey as well, but God has really helped me leave my complacency and find and develop a greater thing uh, in my life and to instill that kind of knowledge and uh, love to others. Yeah. What I really love about your story, Isaac, um, is, is the fact that your life had begun to change. It began to redirect. It became to be uh, more filled with substance and meaning, so much so that you didn't even realize it, but your friends did. Yeah. It, it was you. You were kind of migrating out of the way that you used to live, complacency and indifference, and your friends noticed that and they objected to it. Mm -hmm. Multiple times. Yeah, they they Cost pushed so back problems. on it because they were they were living that same that same place, but you didn't even realize that because of your devotion that your life had begin to take a new shape and a new meaning, and your, your behaviors were responding to that. My friends who clawed at me and pulled me back, I think it was because I kept moving forward in God's direction, they apologized. They supported me for, after seeing how well I've developed, after seeing how happy um, this life mm -hmm. has made me, my friends realized this is what he wants to do, mm -hmm. and all I can do is support it. And I was really thankful for God for having my friends like come back to me and understand 
this is where I want to be. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing today, Isaac. I appreciate it. Thank you for being up here and <laughs> ministering to us today. Um, we, we've got some more stories to come. We have a couple more weeks and some other great stories coming. Um, I want to let you know there are a few different ways that you can participate or re receive prayer at Lifeline. Um, the first one that's probably the most long-standing is that we have a team of individuals who come up here on Wednesdays and intercede on behalf of our community, uh, our city, our missionaries, and beyond. And, uh, and so we would, we would love to make that available to you if you want to come pray on Wednesday mornings. Uh, you can just, we're up in one of these mods. Virginia is kind of my point person. She gives me updates of, um, and asks for prayer requests and those sorts of things. And so we would love for you to come participate, or if you, if you just want to receive prayer, if you want us to pray with you, um, you can, there's, there's prayer request cards right here at the Welcome Center. You can just fill those out, drop them in the basket, and we will make sure that those are passed on to our team to pray for you. Uh, secondly, you can come early to service. You can come early to service. We have about 15 minutes of prayer of uh, collective organi organized prayer that we have where we can let the Lord minister to us before we engage in our services. And so if you'd like to come early, we'll have our coffee out for you. Come get a cup of coffee. You come participate in prayer uh, at about 945 on Sunday mornings, and you can join us and you can pray as we enter into service on Sunday mornings. And then thirdly, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite um, uh, Virginia and Heidi. You can come up over here. Um, I want to give us some space at the end of service today. Just as we close, if you, when I dismiss, you can you can exit if you need to, but I want to just let you know that we have people here who want to pray with you with what you're going through today, regardless of uh, if it was, if it's something that's um, family or financial or medical, or if it's you or if it's somebody else, uh, we want to be a people who intercede on behalf of the other because we believe that the Lord blesses the prayers of, the, of those who are righteous. And when the righteous gather in prayer and intercession, that he's going to bless it. That being said, I don't want to assume that everybody in here understands what it really looks like to be devoted, and you want to make a decision today to be devoted. And you want to say, I'm not, I'm not going to try to play this game of trying to change behavior anymore. I'm going to let my behavior be a reflection of my devotion to the Lord, but I want the Lord to help. I want Jesus to empower me to do so because I can't do so myself. So if that's you, I want to invite you as well to come down, and we can, we can, um, we can bring some more folks down if we need to here. Uh, but Heidi and Virginia would love to pray with you. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just dismiss in just a moment, moment as I pray, but I'm going to invite you to respond and seek prayer if you'd like to. And so any of those ways, if you want to come on a Wednesday morning or let us pray with you on a Wednesday morning, you can do that. You can come early on a Sunday morning and pray with us. Or you can, you can come right now after service, and you can, we can pray today. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you right now. Maybe there's something on your heart. Maybe there's something I said or something that the Lord revealed to you in worship or in Isaac's, Isaac's story that he shared that you said, man, the Lord has prompted me. I need to respond to this. Well, this is an opportunity I want to give to you today. And opportunities, you got to take them when they're given. When the Lord's given you an opportunity and you, he says, I think you should do this, then it's, it's appropriate to respond because you may not— you may not get the opportunity back. And so I'm going to invite you to do that. And so what I'm going to do is, let's, let's do this. I'm going to pray, and then um, I'm going to dismiss, and we'll just have some music playing. If you just want to put the, the, the music on, and, and you all can be dismissed and do what you normally do, or you can come up and receive prayer. We'd love to pray with you. Lord, we thank you today that your grace is sufficient and that you implore us by laying down your life and saying, this is worth everything to me, to come to me. But at the same time, you empower us so that we don't have to be the ones capable of making these changes in our own life. God, we don't have to suddenly be people who have our lives together and have all of our activities worked out, but God, we can be devoted to you because you have given us the ability to through your Holy Spirit. God, I ask that you administer to those in this room today that you would bless them and give them courage and give them peace. Help them to be, become people of peace and courage. People of strength, not in their own might, but because of you, Lord. And God, I thank you for stories like Isaac's that bring transformation that are noticeably different to the world around us. Could we be people who are devoted to you and so much so that the world would take notice? 
God, we love you, and we thank you, and we ask for your blessings today on our congregation and our community. We love you. Amen. Amen. All right. Blessings on you. May the Lord cause you to be fruitful and successful and give you favor in everything that you do this week, guys. Amen.